Mr. Ryan Falkenberg, who is the co-founder of Clever, one of the top AI companies in the country, and Professor Herman Stain, who's our project management guru, uh, who teaches at the University of Pretoria Graduate School of Technology Management. Welcome. Thank you. Before we start, we just want to I uh, want to talk a little bit about the structure. This is a flowing conversation between two experts that's going to be framed a bit by the questions I will pose. I will pose about two to three questions. And then after a conversation about 20 or so minutes, we will open it up to questions from the floor so our, 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 our speakers can respond. We hope you enjoy it. Think of it as a talk show. Okay, so I'd like to start now. But I want to start by saying something about AI. Um, as AI, more and more work is projectized, the use of artificial intelligence is looming and already is becoming an important dimension of how projects get done. Should project managers be threatened by the rise of AI and project management? I mean, that's a very good question. I hear people say they're afraid for their jobs, et cetera. Artificial intelligence is the latest buzzword in project management. And according to EY Growth Barometer 2018 report, South Africa is tied third with Singapore in the early adoption of artificial intelligence. And that ranking is higher than countries like Russia, Germany, and the United States. Anything that can be automated will be automated. Anything that can be digitized will be digitized. But is it all about efficiency? Or is AI really about optimal human performance. According to Herd Leonard, the German, renowned German futurist, efficiency is for robots. Our future is human, only work. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Herman. I would like to start out with a question initially to you, Ryan, as the expert in AI. Can you just briefly tell us what AI is about? Because we think we know but I'm not sure we really understand it completely. Um, so the, in the world of automation, I think it was a good word you used, um, there really are two forms of, of technology. There's the autonomous doing technology. Sorry. Uh, there's the autonomous doing technologies. The technologies from the last couple of decades where we prescribed the codes to these technologies and their role was to execute according to our code. So we pre-thought out the logic for them. And the focus of those technologies was executing our pre-thought logic in doing. But we needed human beings to make the decisions pre that doing. They needed to understand the context, apply the rules. And when they had made the decision, they could enter it into the operating system. It would then ex execute according to that decision. Um, we're now moving into the world of autonomous thinking or decision-making technologies, the technologies that are now being able to make the decisions without us, without us even having to prescribe the codes to them. They'll be working that out for themselves. So I think in terms of the AI, it's a very broad uh, technology landscape, but if you could think of it as the, the technologies which are starting to make autonomous decisions based on uh, their own ability to learn and their own ability to access data and insights without the need for us to prescribe the decision logic they need to apply. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, well, the first question I would like to ask is, after that, how does AI change the world of work and how will it change the world of work in the future? Now, maybe I can pose that to you, Professor Stain, yeah. speaking from a project management perspective. Yeah, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, half a century ago with the moon landing, there was a lot of hype about space travel. And back then in 1969, there was a movie made uh, that about the, a science fiction movie about the distant future and technology. And uh, on the, in this movie, there was a man pl uh, playing chess against the computer. <laughs> and a professor then commented in the, in the newspaper 
that uh, that's impossible, it's ridiculous, it's far-fetched. <laughs> computers will never be able to play chess because computers can't think. Now, this professor was from Wits University, so you shouldn't even take her seriously in any case. Uh, but uh, that's the one mistake we can make. We can underestimate uh, the effect of that technology will have and has got. I underestimated the effect of, uh, of the internet and email. Uh, it's changing the world. The other mistake, however, that we can make is to, to exaggerate. Uh, think about Y2K, the big hype that it was about Y2K airplanes would drop out of the air and all sorts of things, and it was all much ado about nothing. So I think we should guard against both those two and be, uh, in all humility say that we don't know the future, we haven't got a crystal ball, but the impacts are going to be there and we're experiencing it already. Uh, as Lynn, Lynn said, everything that will digi be digitized can be, will be digitized. Anything that can be automated will be automated. And I think those are, that, that reflects the two spheres that things are changing. First of all, work is being done more by, increasingly by computers. There are computers that do plastering, bricklaying, welding, all of those things. That's, uh, that can be automated and it's automated, it's done by machines. Smart machines are really taking over many jobs. Uh, the other field is where you said anything that can be digitized will be digitized. And uh, that uh, to me says that information uh, is increasing in being handled differently. Uh, you've got, uh, you don't have surveyors measuring up in open, open cast mines anymore. You've got drones doing it much faster, more accurately, more efficiently, and so on. So that information and then the processing of that information, that's increasingly uh, getting important. And I think that's on the management. The, the smart machines is more on the worker side, but the information management is more on the, on, the, on the project manager's side, and that's what's influencing the role of the project manager. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Star Trek fan. How many Star Trekkies are in here? Okay, just a few. Look, I remember watching an episode with Data. Now, you know Data is an android. He was created by a scientist and programmed by that scientist, so very much is a replicant of the scientists. However, in one episode, he was trying to understand human emotions, how humans think. And because he is a logical being, engineered to be logical, his whole system started to kind of fall apart as he tried to take on these human emotions. And that makes me, uh, it brings me to the question, okay? Things can be digitized, things can be automated, but ultimately, Technology operates in the human space. So what is, talk about that intersection between technology and human beings in the world of space. As I mentioned, the world of, of AI. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, Leonard, uh, Garrett Lenerhardt has said that our future is human-only work. And he explained that by saying that, yes, machines will do many things for us, but the best way to ensure our survival in our work is to do those things and develop those things that only human beings can do. So maybe, um, Ryan, you could respond to that first? I think, <clears throat> I think uh, we have a profound future ahead of us. Um, technology, <clears throat> as a human being, when I grew up, um, part of my uh, personality, part of my meaning was my skill at making decisions better than my counterparts. I had to learn the code of my forefathers at school. Um, they taught me what they had known, and um, if I could upload that code quicker than my peers, if I could recall that code better than them, um, and if I could make decisions quicker than them, I could outcompete them. So in a way, part of my, my personal being was my ability to replicate decisions. Um, and that is very useful in organizations that were fundamentally paternalistic. So organizations are built historically on paternalism. We have uh, owners of the code, we call them executives or managers, and they define what this business does and how it does it. Uh, they write the code of that operation in operating systems, in, in technologies, in processes of which we uh, as professionals are part of that code writing. And the job of the staff member is then to replicate that code for us so that we can scale. So really, as human beings, our meanings in work, in work 
has been our ability to replicate logic. Um, we are not really individuals. Uh, we are replicators. Um, and so what we're starting to pick up now with these new technologies is that that role of decision making is going to increasingly become redundant. That if something is known, if a decision is known and it's highly complex and multi-contextual, technology will make that decision far more accurately than human beings. And so what I look at with my children is, is what is their purpose? Because our schools still are training my children <coughs> to be effective replicators of someone's code. Um, and actually what this technology offers them is liberation. Liberation from being bound into replication. That they can actually start becoming individuals again. They can learn what they think. They can become creative. They can become effective in terms of new ideas, in terms of facilitating effective teamwork, driving the EQ. They, in a, in a way, can focus their learning on the future. What is the possibility? rather than what I spent my life doing was focusing on the past, what has already been done. That was education's job, training me on the past. The future is actually exciting for my children because they, their challenge is to learn what isn't known. Mm. And the way that these technologies are, are offering us that ability is to take over the role of replication decision-making. However, with that, in terms of the world of work, comes risk because you have the ability then to scale decision-making very powerfully and quickly, as opposed to in the, in the human era where I had to convince each individual to learn the code, remember the code, replicate the code. And so it was a bitty management process where I had to try and get everyone on the same page and aligned. Now I can scale very quickly and make those decisions at, at pace. Um, and so the, the world of work, I think, is going to fundamentally change in what we do and why we even go to work. And I think there are going to be many people who will never work, who will be useless in terms of the useless cost class model. They will not be employable. But there will be those who actually need to start adding new value and new thinking, and they will certainly have those opportunities. And finally, I think there's a real excitement as we move into the conscious age of asking ourselves as human beings, what are we really? Are we meant on this earth to work and replicate and go, to, go and do grind work and come back? Or is there something else for us? Can we get technologies to do a lot of that for us? And is there something else for us? And I think that something else is a question we all need to still answer. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah, uh, what is beyond knowledge? I think it's Einstein who said that beyond knowledge is imagination. Uh, and I think that's, that's what Brian says, that this imagination, the, the creativity, innovativeness, entrepreneurship, those things I don't think can be, can be automated, can be digitized. But even in decision making, uh, yes, a lot of decisions uh, will be made by, by IT systems. And uh, some of it may be, there might be something good in it. I think a lot of emotions can be taken out of it. A lot of subjectivity can be taken out of it. So there can be positives about that. But I think there's also negatives about that. Uh, in that the human, uh, we've got, a fifth sense. We've got uh, intuition. Uh, that's something that uh, I, don't, I doubt whether you can get that into a system, into an, a technology system. Uh, managers take, uh, take clues from a lot of places. Uh, a machine or a, a, a device will always be dependent on input from someone or from somewhere. And I think we as human beings, we take note subconsciously of the body language of people and you just, or the movement of his eyes or something like that, the tone in the voice. And we say, I don't trust that guy or I trust him. I think he's knowing what he, I know what he's talking about. That trust and that, uh, you know, we, so we get these, will a machine be able to recognize like we do subconsciously body language, tone of voice, uh, I doubt. I'm, uh, I'm not too sure, but I doubt it's Just a uh, uh, I mean, I actually totally believe we, we overestimate ourselves. Um, I think as decision-making engines, we're rather poor. Um, I think a lot of our intuition is actually on uh, data points that we have that we are making in a subconscious level. 
But technology is going to have way more data to make those intuitive decisions. Intuition is really subconscious decision making on data points that you are picking up. It's not a magic. There's no magic to it. Um, it's just that we're not conscious of where that decision came from. What you're going to start finding with digital intelligence is going to be connected to far greater sets of data, far greater sets of patterns. So it's going to be able to pick up that eye movement. It, uh, increasingly, we're getting technologies that can read, uh, that can view, that can see, hear, touch, and feel. We're giving all of the senses to these technologies. The power is that they can connect across the globe so they can learn from billions of other uh, networked sensors. I can only learn from myself and from what I speak to other people. The, these technologies can learn through huge, increasing volume data sets. Their patterns will get more accurate. And I believe that actually they'll make us feel a little bit and, and very insignificant in terms of their accuracy of decision making. Um, which again challenges us into saying, given that, what, what is the purpose of work and what do we do at work and how do we handle projects that are becoming increasingly adaptive, self-adaptive in terms of processes rather than prescriptive and waterfall versus agile. I think those are very important considerations because the world of work and the role of people, I believe, is going to fundamentally change in the next, certainly when my, when my children are big. Uh, that's a very good point. It's a nice segue into what I was going to ask both of you. I mean, the whole idea of replication, okay, bring, it makes me think about the fact that project management is based on predict, uh, uh, prediction and that prediction is predicated on control. Yeah. And we're, in this, and we're working in an environment that is not very stable in terms of potential change and also complexity. Yeah. And, it, and if you look at projects themselves or systems, you can look at them as social systems, you can look at them as engineering systems, but they are systems and systems adapt to the environment. So maybe both of you from different perspectives can speak to how is this phenomena of the, I won't call it the invasion, but the, 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 the um, inevitability of artificial intelligence impacting the way we work. How does that impact project management? How we do it today? And um, our thinking as project managers, and this project management also is based on working in teams, working with people, not working with machines. Uh, uh, yeah, on uh, artificial intelligence, that's one uh, techno techno technological trend. There are several other, other trends. I don't know whether you can see this, this slide from the back there, but there is the mainframe computer, the S curve, the mainframe computer. Now. Uh, This line here is artificial intelligence. That is, uh, those two yellowish lines are more like big data and so on. This is artificial intelligence, but there's another one emerging there. That's uh, quantum, quantum computing. Now, as you can see by 2020, quantum computing is just emerging. And uh, the point is that neuro, neuro uh, scientists and even philosophers say that the human brain is already using quantum computing. Now, the quantum computing, I don't know, I'm not a computer specialist, but we work in, in bits uh, on and off. Uh, whereas, and they, someone explained that, they said that's like the two poles of, uh, of a sphere. If you look at the, at the globe, the planet, our planet as a sphere, the uh, on off is just North Pole, South Pole. Whereas the qubit has got a lot more information. Think about the globe. There's a lot of information deep down in the, in the three dimensions that we don't even know. So the quantum computing is a lot more powerful than, than uh, the current computing that we've got. And there's no way to tell which way it will go, but I just, for some way, how I just feel that we are superior to, to uh, machines. I can't think of, our, uh, of us just being robots with uh, fairly sophisticated uh, wiring of, uh, and electrons flowing. I think there's something metaphysical maybe about us, uh, maybe even something spiritual, uh, maybe, yeah, even, even religion. You know, there's some things that I think are in the metaphysical world that a computer will, be, will find difficult to, to, uh, to emulate. Uh, 
We find it difficult as humans to transfer knowledge from one human to the other. We find it difficult to transfer knowledge from one project team to another project team. Uh, Snowden said, you only know what you know uh, when you need it. Uh, and this whole thing of experience, so we learn from experience. And it's very difficult to transfer that tacit knowledge to another person. Uh, never mind to a, to, a, to a machine or computer, and then from that computer to expect from that computer to transfer that knowledge and tacit knowledge to another person or to another machine. That's, it sounds a bit far-fetched to me. I, yeah, I can build it. I mean, the interesting part is that even conversations around um, future rights of digital intelligence is, <laughs> is that uh, what is it that makes us special? Um, you know, as technologies become and they start having personas and they actually start making decisions, um, there's a view around taxation, around their decision making and rights to digital intelligence. And so there's, there's a, we have an existential crisis. We are trying to work out what makes us special. And I think it's an important uh, in, uh, personal journey for all of us. But I, if, I, if I just move back into the world of, of project management, what I think is changing for us is that we've We've lived in a world of swim lanes where, where it, everything is so easy to understand, it's logical, um, it's one dimensional, and, um, and so we can manage it according to a sequential pro uh, process. And that gives us comfort and it gives us a sense of control. What I think is starting to happen in the digital economy is our, and within the quantum space is there's a, a realization of interconnectedness. Um, and that actually we are part of meta systems and everything is about systems. And so if you are not able to wrap your head around systems thinking and actually work very comfortably in the complexity of systems, I think within the project management space, you're going to find it very difficult because increasingly things aren't going to land quite like you thought it. Uh, the variables are going to change all the time and you're just not going to see things coming your way that then uh, undo what your perfect project was looking to achieve. And I think that's going to be a massive change for all of us, is this complex systems and a multitude of variables that are influencing the system are increasingly starting to inter interact. We used to be able to isolate ourselves. Now we are struggling to isolate ourselves and the variables that are influencing us are starting to accelerate. And as project managers, complexity is going to be your new world, as complexity is going to be for all of us. And it's how you handle that that I think will differentiate you. I would like to pose one last question before we go into the Q&A session. I don't know how many have read the books by Harari, uh, Sapien, and Homo Deus. Okay. In, the, in Homo Deus, uh, the author talks about the fact that historically up until around now, we've been biologically, our evolution has been biologically determined. But then says that from here on, is going to be intelligent design, evolution by intelligent design. And the author suggests three types of beings in the future. One is an enhanced human being with enhanced thinking ability. The other one is like a cyborg, another Star Trek fan, if you know what cyborgs are, which is combining the human physiological nature with that of machine intelligence. And the third one would be a totally intelligent, designed, engineered being that is not human. Okay. So I want to put to our speakers here. <laughs> oh, one last thing she says is if we go that route, when we go that route, and there's a possibility we are already going that route. Okay. The fact that a whole different, the different nature of a intelligently, intel, uh, a engineered designed uh, being and different ways of thinking that goes along with it almost makes it impossible for us to even predict what the future will look like because we do not even have the mind of that sort of being to even imagine the possibilities. So given that, <laughs> adding a bit of complexity here, how, what would you tell people about their, the, the, uh, how to handle, how to manage this whole new technology phase of our existence and work. I think you touched on it, Ryan, but I'd like to hear from both of you a little bit again, some parting words before we go into the Q&A. 
Look, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating construct. I, what's, what's starting to happen in the, in the historical terms, the, the rich class used to keep their children powerful by sending them to Oxford and, um, and, and getting them their brains coded in a better way than uh, the working class. So we were able to uh, differentiate simply by access to information. Um, the, the, the super class going forward, what, what's increasingly starting to become apparent is their, the, the view of how they can start augmenting their children's brains with digital intelligence. So it's, it's, a, it's not science fiction to consider yourself being able to actually have an implant into the uh, web and to be able to automatically make decisions that are leveraging um, huge data sources globally. Um, instead of you going on your phone and saying, hey, Google, um, your brain will automatically um, assess that, um, tap into a, a broader network and make a decision that's leveraging massive computing power. So what starts happening is, again, as human beings, we have to keep asking ourselves the question, is the decision making that we, that we are currently doing what differentiates us? Um, is access to information powerful? Or will it be that increasingly digital intelligence will become embedded in us? We already, we already have these type of watches. We already make sure Discovery knows everything about us. Um, and that Facebook knows more about you than you know about yourself. Increasingly, um, unless you are become conscious, um, you'll be able to be heavily manipulated by a lot of the variations or, or, or digital inputs that you're given in terms of your brain because it'll be shaped for you. Um, and it will become your echo chamber and you'll believe of whatever you believe mm -hmm. because it will be able to be externally um, guided. So I think what's, what's happening is from the human race perspective is that we are in, again, in an existential crisis. You're seeing it in the States, for example. We are, our brains are, are hitting a stage where we can't cope with change and we can't cope with the complexity we're dealing with. So we look for simplicity. We need, for example, someone to make the complex simple. We need Trump to say that there are bad people and good people, that the Mexicans are the problem, and we are not, for example, automation. We need, uh, in Brexit, it's going to be, there's always an other. So there's greater sexism, there's greater racism, there's greater um, uh, walls being built, simply because the human race is hitting its cognitive max. And it now needs... Uh, somebody, some magical person to simplify things for us and to create uh, an ease of decision making. Mm -hmm. And and so as a as societies, we're in, in a high risk uh, environment where we can be, manipul be manipulated quite powerfully by people who want to manipulate us. Um, and I think that's going to be very, very important going forward is our ability to stay aware of the dynamic nature of what's happening, how digital intelligence is impacting us, how it's going to become part and parcel of our world, and you won't even know it. Um, and I think that's going to become critical for all of us, is hyper-awareness of how digital intelligence is going to augment us, it's going to form part of us. It will be. Our, my children will have digital intelligence embedded in them, and they will be influenced heavily by the macro. What, what, what I hope to teach them is how to handle that and how to stay true to the individual, and how to learn what does it mean to be me. Because that is ultimately going to differentiate or define them as a human being and as an individual, as opposed to the, the number of decisions that are going to be influencing them from the macro, which in a way could make them a non-individual. Mm. And so we have very interesting, as again, this, we are in, a, in a, I believe, a, a massive shift globally from a consciousness perspective and from an economic, political, and social perspective. And I don't think many of us are truly prepared for what's coming. Uh, Professor Stein, do you want to add to that yeah. in terms of... More, 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 more like a question. Uh, it seems that artificial intelligence is developing a higher and higher IQ, uh, but does it develop an EQ, emotionally uh, proficient? You seem to... to no, I, I believe, I believe uh, for example, in contact centers where we spend a lot of our time, um, the IQ is, is the replication component, and yeah. we can augment people. They don't need that. What is differentiating them is their EQ, their ability to have great customer conversations, but to be navigated through real-time calls without having to worry, do I know my products, my policies, my procedures? Do I know the rules? We've got technology that will augment them and navigate them through real-time calls and give them optimal routing. So their effort is, can I give a great customer engagement experience 
as opposed to do I know what questions to ask based on the policy or the procedure that I learned. So there's no question that as, uh, as a differentiator, the EQ component, which our schools do not drive, um, is actually a, a key differentiator for us. Yeah. Uh, aren't the uh, technology systems more specialized uh, and be more general, generalist? You know, if we, uh, we, I said earlier that there's the, uh, the work that's been done by, by, by uh, clever machines, smart machines, and then there's the information side. Now, if I can just uh, have the analogy on the, on the machine side, uh, you get machines that can plaster, you can do mach get machines that do bricklaying, you get machines that drive vehicles, you get machines that weld, uh, and a machine that welds can weld much better than I can, a uh, machine that uh, does bricklaying can do it much better than I can do it, but I can do all of those things you know, at a basic level at least. Now, if you think about the analogy in, analogy in the information side, on the uh, devices still very specialized that they can do one thing, it can do one thing very well, but it's not a generalist. Project manager is a generalist. Uh, can it really be that, uh, cover that broad spectrum of, of intellectual work, or can it just do one specific, one specific specialized task? So where we are with AI as specialists, we, assess, we, we don't have general AI, um, and it absolutely is, is uh, focused and, and designed for specialist decision making. Um, but as, as we develop and go along the way, um, you know, the, there's a big debate around whether general AI will ever realize. Um, but, I, but I think for me, the bigger debate is there's going to be a lot of specialist AI around to augment us. Yeah. Um, we need to be the masters of our future and we need to be conscious of our strategic decision making and our, our principle based decision making. The actual execution of those decisions, mm -hmm. I think, will increasingly be uh, done by our technology. Okay. So thank, thank, if we if we could, this, this is a fantastic conversation, but I think we need to now bring it to the audience. Um, are there any questions you'd like to pose? In project management, PMP speaks a lot throughout it, and PM Bach about ethics and social responsibility. And you were talking about AI is a lot about decision making, and project management is a lot about decision making. Where do you see the lines crossing and how to handle ethics and with artificial intelligence? The ethics components is a fascinating one. Um, you, you might have well read the, the conundrum about the self-driving vehicles, and if Mercedes programs its um, vehicle to uh, make a decision in the self-driving to uh, protect the highest paying customer. Um, and it places in the algorithm is another self-driving vehicle with a, a mother and a child. And uh, these cars are gonna uh, actually crash. Who, who takes the knock? Well, uh, you could make it so that it's the highest paying elderly gentleman. Um, and so, <laughs> Where do you see that logic and, and, and where is ethics? Ethics is going yeah. to become paramount because it is the principles of our decision making that steer the actual execution of those decisions. And um, part of our challenge is that I don't believe we have sight of the ethics of a lot of the, the black box decision making that's happening. Mm. Um, and in your world of project management, um, the ability to audit and prove compliance to a decision making is going, is a massive thing. And as part of the challenge in the AI world is creating audit trails of that logic. You've got deep learning. How do you prove at that point why that decision was made based on billions of possible predictions? Mm -hmm. So I think this, this issue of ethics is paramount. And, mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to shape a lot of the conversations going forward. How do we learn in terms of project management? Currently, uh, if you could talk about how we currently learn, the use of the tools, the techniques, the fact that people use templates. I know project managers who don't want to do anything without a template. In fact, can't do anything without a template, unfortunately. But that goes back to the replication mode of learning and doing. I think what we have, have possibly got wrong is in our, in our project management rollout in terms of learning is that we think we, in, in terms of the people who are going to adopt our projects is that we are trying to encode them with the formulas of our projects so they execute our formulas. Um, so we actually uh, replicate these, these problems in the way we train. I think current training models are redundant. We should actually not have a parent in the room telling me what to learn, the coding. 
We should rather build digital intelligence to say, this is what I need you to do. Therefore, I'd rather build a digital brain that executes what I need you to do so that I could rather get you to add value to what we're doing. So from a project management perspective, we need to rethink about how do we capture logic that we need uh, scaled and how do we rather digitize logic and rather see human beings in a different format, not the executors of our logic, but rather ask of, of the staff, what can they add value to outside of that logic? And stop training, mm -hmm. stop knowledge management, start embracing AI as an enabler of your projects. Okay. Professor Stein, did you want to, uh, one last comment, yeah, uh, 30 seconds? <laughs> uh, I used to manage projects in the era before there were so many templates. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and someone asked me, how did you do it uh, without all these templates? And I said, I think a lot better because we used our intuition, we used common sense, we didn't tick boxes. Uh, uh, stakeholder engagement, okay, let me quickly speak to someone, I can tick the box. Charter, let me quickly write something so I can tick the box. Compliance officer, we, we, were, we really were managers. Mm. And I think we're going to move back to that. Mm. And you'll have to, the project manager will have to decide, I'm going to use the specialized IT information system to help me with decision in a specific area. I'm going to use another system to help me somewhere else. But I will be, still be in control. Can we give a round of applause to our speakers, please? Thank you.